We move right on then to uh, crowd news of the week, water infrastructure news. Anybody heard this week? Anything interesting out there? No. Not a very, not a very exciting week for water infrastructure. There was a, actually there was a cool article in the New York Times that was called something like how to think like the Dutch, mm -hmm. and it was oh, actually yeah, yeah. like how yeah. the Dutch are getting rid of levees in some places and trying to build so that the water can come in and having resilient infrastructure. Yeah. That'll, right. They say allow. Isn't that they call it room for rivers. Room for rivers. Yeah. Yeah, and they're they're not so much um, getting rid of them as they're moving them back, but basically they have the money to buy out all the farmers. And that's how they're going to do it. So, so yeah, obviously, a country that's worried about its water infrastructure. <coughs> so. Well, they they have no control of the Rhine, so they, because that that's what the major river that goes through the Netherlands and it's coming from Germany, and they have no control over the anything coming into the Netherlands, essentially. But they're also planning to have the Rhine bypass on one of the major cities. They're going to reroute the Rhine. That's another one of the problems. Sounds cheap. <laughs> <laughs> And part of that too is that I guess we we now have one of the head guys from the Netherlands on one of Obama's task forces having to do with like right. rebuilding from the second day, trying right. to implement some of these similar ideas. Yeah, I think that I think that's yeah, they were talking about that in the mm -hmm. So uh, the best the best I could come up with this week for water infrastructure news, the American Water Works Association just released last week their State of the Water Industry Report 2014. It's actually not as dismal as I expected it to be. I mean, it projects very large amounts of money needed for water and wastewater infrastructure over the next 25 years. They say upwards of $2 trillion. Uh, but they didn't do badly in, in all categories. I'll just provide a couple of, couple of high, highlights and maybe try and make some fuzz, uh, fun quiz quiz questions out of it, since that's my thing. Uh, so they had about 1,700 respondents. Um, I thought it was actually interesting in terms of, let me see here, how respondents thought that the water industry was doing by state. Where would you guys expect New York to show up out of the 50? How are we defining, like, how's the water industry doing? What are those parameters? Yeah, so there was a scale of one to seven, and they basically asked them, what is the health of the water industry on a scale of one to seven, seven being high, one being low? Um, very general question. And so uh, New York was right in the middle, actually, about, about in the middle. Can anybody guess the worst state? The state where people perceived their health industry to be, their water Health industry, to, the health of their water industry, to be the worst out of all 50 states. West Virginia. <laughs> Perceived, but no. Texas, they, Colorado, California. yeah, California. West Virginia was pretty bad, but no, Texas. It's a, you can usually yeah. safely pick West Virginia to be bad in a lot of categories. Nobody's gonna yeah. guess. It. So just, nobody's gonna guess. So I'll just say it was Vermont. I was oh. gonna say Vermont. You are. You were not going to say Vermont. I just said that When you said no one was going to guess it, then I was going to say yeah. okay. <laughs> um, maybe, maybe people in Vermont are more critical of their own industry. Huh. Or yeah. uh, Vermont is one of the most rural, if not the most rural state, at least in the continuous I think it lower is. states. So um, <laughs> they probably have a lot of these rural issues in terms of what if you don't have population density to support their systems. So it's actually conceivable that Vermont does have a lot of uh, water industry issues. Um, so that was, a, that was an interesting, interesting candidate for. Some of that could also be precipitated by the damage from the storms. So I think there might be, be some seasonality to it in some way. From uh, was it, it was Lee that went up. Irene. 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 Um, okay. So that was that. I got a couple more. I can make a couple more fun questions out of this. Uh, top 10 issues that respondents thought were of critical need in their state. So in other words, how did respondents, what, what did respondents think were the most important issues facing their industry? Number one, anybody? 
Aging infrastructure. Aging infrastructure. Okay. Right. I've so not seen the report, well, and we didn't talk. Yeah, so. I didn't talk. <laughs> so number one was the state of water and sewer infrastructure. And 63% uh, of respondents from all places uh, said it was critically, their most critically important issue. I, I just guess because the last year, Black and Weech did a similar report, so I'm not sure if this is it's a been new... The, it's been the same... Very consistent responses. for like the last six years. Right. So yeah, it's always... The responses same. are consistent. Um, Anything else? Any other top top tens? Taste. <laughs> People complain about that. Taste is not not in the top ten. Although it might Fun be. There's thirty of them here, but I'm not even gonna. Funding. <laughs> Funding. So uh, financing for capital improvements is number three. Okay. Who did they pull for this? You said it was 1,700 people, but is it just like people in the water industry? Is it just like people? Yeah. Somewhere there's a table that says exactly who who responded. I, I don't know where it is right now, but yeah, a lot of it's utility, and then I think it's some NGOs, and there might be some government agency folks and things like that. I'm not sure to what extent they pull public. So, we got to get at least three of the top ten things. We got to we got to come up with one more. Funding, aging infrastructure. Come on, you could just name like the titles of the lectures in the class. Water quality. Water quality. Supply issues. Water quality is not on here. Not on the top. <laughs> supply, long-term water supply availability, number two. Mm -hmm. We actually got the top one, two, three. Climate, so some something to do with climate. Something with climate is not in the top ten. Ooh. Um, although you could argue that drought or periodic water shortages, which yeah. somehow mm -hmm. is separate from long-term water supply. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these are very related. Um, I'll just go through a couple other ones. Four and five both have to do with public understanding of the value of water resources and water systems, respectively. Groundwater management and overuse is number six, which probably gets into the water supply issue. Um, watershed protection is actually <coughs> number seven, which is maybe a little surprising that utilities would be concerned about. It's not totally surprising, but it, it's nice to see that utilities are so concerned with watershed protection. <coughs> Cost recovery, number 10. Emergency preparedness, number 9. Possibly related to climate change, things like that. Uh, so that covers the top 10. 8% um, of respondents felt that their utility was not at all able to cover the full cost of service. Um, and that that number would double within the next five years. So a couple other things there. Uh, let's see what else we got here. This is interesting. They have the top three current regulatory concerns identified by utilities. Anybody want to make, make any guesses? Current regulatory concerns? Now what is the U.S.? <laughs> navigable waters. <laughs> navigable waters. Yeah, what is navigable waters? Just the, the things that we've been talking about for, for the most part. Pollutant discharges, maybe not surprising. Mm -hmm. Not sure how you would say it's a regulatory concern, but um, combined sewer overflows. So those are things that people get hit with compliance orders a lot for. So uh, some sort of court court judgment going against them for stormwater issues. And the third the third one is disinfection byproducts. Um, future regulatory concerns, and by future they mean five years from now. Pharmaceuticals. Security and preparedness, and again, disinfection byproducts. So apparently, in the near future, pollutant discharge and sewer overflows are not going to be a problem. problem. We'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, right, there was a... One thing that we haven't actually highlighted, and I'm, I'm not sure how interested this class is going to be uh, about this, but something that I think you hear about a lot if you talk to operators and you're even remotely interacting with the industry. 1% uh, of the respondents indicated that the water industry was fully prepared to address issues related to talent attraction and retention uh, in the next five years. 1%? 1% thought that they were prepared. So essentially, <laughs> if you look at waste, I don't know, Karen, you just went to Newburgh and talked to their water operators wastewater treatment plant operator. I'm not sure exactly. How old do you figure those guys are? Uh, Hopefully this turns out. Water plant operators were all in their 50s or 60s. Yeah. I would say, I would say that's very typical. Um, the youngest person we spoke to was the city engineer. Okay. Yeah. So 
pretty, it's pretty typical to have all the operators of these facilities be like fairly old, they've been around for a while, uh, you know, they know what they're talking about, but the, the, the idea is that not a lot of people go to college these days thinking, I'd really like to run a wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> it's just not really happening. Even in engineering, I feel like it's not stressed. Um, you know, it, it, people want to do, they want to go off and be consultants maybe. Consulting sounds cool. Operator doesn't sound so cool. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, a lot, of this, a lot of the skills are the same. So if you talk to them, you know, I've had like train plant operators be like, you ever think about joining, coming into the business? You know, like, we need somebody to come on. I mean, they really need people, and it's like a, it's a big problem. The idea is that as some of these people start to retire, you don't have skilled workers coming in with that knowledge base to take over those plants. And if you don't have a skilled operator, the first thing that suffers is probably water quality. Like, immediately, the water quality will suffer if the people who are running the plant don't know, you know, which levers to, to pull and things like that. So. Is it a that's funny. Sorry. <laughs> I was say, that's funny. I did walk out of undergrad wanting to be in a wastewater treatment operator, <laughs> <laughs> but didn't feel like the the position announcements were there. Like uh, they were all looking for experienced persons. So I wonder if part of the other equation is uh, the the bringing in new new blood was not they're not prepared to do that. I don't know. Yeah. Or like, what's the first step in in terms of you can't immediately become you know, out of college and opera. Uh, you know, the head head operator, but like what's that next what's that first step? And related to that, like I wonder how much A W W A that's that's the acronym I yep. Yep. Yeah. Like how much they're doing with like outreach and engagement with like freshly graduated or or current students. You know? Sure. Because I went to like one joint meeting of that for New York mm -hmm. and it was meeting with like the Water Environment Association. And it was like everybody there was pretty old. Yeah, no, you, it feels weird. You're in the crowd and you're like, everybody here is definitely 15 to 20 years older than I am. Um, so, and I'm already kind of old. A little bit. Yeah. I'm not that old, I'm just saying. Uh, 20. Well, it's just enough. It's true. Yeah. It's true. So I thought that was interesting just to at least uh, bring up let you guys know that that is a pervasive problem. The industry feels it. They know it's happening. And it's pretty true. We, we are lacking maybe even the, the people and a, a clear route for like how we replace those, those people. I'll just maybe do one more thing. Page 19 20. I got something here. These were some more positive things that I saw in the survey, in the study. <coughs> Uh, respondents who thought that watershed, okay, we said watershed protection was very important, and utility employees who think that uh, their utilities service area, uh, that it's important for their utility service area to utilize green infrastructure to address stormwater compliance. Uh, okay, 30% said yes, 39% said no, but there was a lot of people who said that's a yes. <laughs> Um, so people are at least thinking about green infrastructure. Um, again, I think it's a bit of a new development, at least in terms of the engineering community, acknowledging that that could be an important piece. So the people who didn't respond, um, or it was like, it was it like 30 years? They didn't know. They didn't a know. don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like they don't know what green infrastructure is, or perhaps? So perhaps? I'll, I'll, read the que I'll read the actual question. Responses from utility employees regarding if their utility or the stormwater manager in their utility service area utilize, so do they oh, utilize okay. green infrastructure? So sorry, I worded that a little bit, a little bit badly. 30% said yes, they do utilize it, or their manager utilizes it. In his house? I'm not sure what that means. 39% um, <laughs> said no, 23% did not know, and 8% said it is being developed, but has not been implemented. So. Any other questions with the AWWA survey? It's on Blackboard. If you want to check it out. Uh, all right. So today we have Karen Donaghy from City and Regional Planning, which I think many of you know. Part of our water infrastructure research team. Uh, also, I'll just say I could mess this up badly, but generally involved in modeling dynamic complex systems could mean uh, everything from transport to economics and. Uh, physical systems, with housing, land use, 
uh, all those things together. And smush you. Yeah. <laughs> title of this talk: Helping Municipalities with Complexity. Thank you, sir. says I'm in the Department of City and Regional Planning and planners are generally concerned with the management of change in territorial systems. So I don't know how many people you've had speak to you this semester about bringing about the changes, organizing the changes, but <coughs> that's my piece of the action. Um, so I'm going to, let's see if this Keyboard? Keyboard, ah, okay, that'll work. There we go. There we go, okay. So what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about a um, ideas behind a planning support system which would help uh, municipalities to part. There's a pretty specific zone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're good. I was curious about that screensaver you had up there. What is that? Going over Niagara Falls or something? <laughs> oh, the new, the new OS operating system is called Mavericks, which is a big wave in California for oh, surfing. Okay. It only comes around like one every so often. As in what to be so able to save the ship? Mavericks is a place in California where you can surf. It's a wave. It's, it's a particular break at a particular place. And if you, and when it's there, it's called Mavericks. Right. <laughs> I didn't make it up. I'm a terrible surveyor. Okay, so um, one of the things that communities are using to cope with very complicated <coughs> situations, such as uh, changing infrastructure systems, is uh, a planning support system. And so I want to uh, talk about the ideas that lie behind those, and um, in particular about one that I'm a part of developing. And then if time permits, I'd also show you planning support system that's been developed out at the University of Illinois that's used to look at water issues and land use change issues. Um, I'm then going to go on and talk about the Hudson River estuary project in which I've been involved and so talk about the specifics of the uh, prototype model development and planning support system development. And then the case of Newburgh, New York, which uh, Sarah Davis and I visited during the spring break to talk to some people there about their water infrastructure problems and then conclude with some questions uh, for discussion, should you wish to discuss them. Okay. So, as you have probably learned throughout the course of the semester, much of the municipal infrastructure built within the last century, including that in New York State municipalities, has reached the end of its service life. We are at a historical point in time uh, where nothing like this has been experienced before. Yes, great cities have been recycled, but we've never had so much engineered systems piled one on top of the other, which makes it awfully difficult to fix any one of them. The American Society of Civil Engineers estimates that nearly 30% of the bridges in the United States are structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. The number of unsafe dams has increased by nearly 33%, and funding for public transit facilities, drinking water, and wastewater management is deemed to be grossly inadequate, as was reported earlier this afternoon. And as the next slide indicates, this situation is not unique to the United States. In fact, there's a great need for infrastructure investment of all types worldwide, but the greatest need is water-related. And if you look at this, table, uh, you can see that it's estimated that $41 trillion of infrastructure investment 
is projected to be needed between this 25 year period here and 22.6 trillion of that is associated with water projects. Um, while there's a great deal that needs to be invested in the United States, more needs to be invested in Latin America and the greatest proportion lies in Asia Pacific areas. So those of you who have studied um, the geography of infrastructure may not be surprised by this, but for some of the rest of us, it, uh, it's pretty staggering. I have a, a chapter on managing changes in infrastructure systems in the uh, Oxford Handbook of Urban Planning and Economics, if you want to take a look uh, at that for a further discussion about such things as financing and uh, infrastructure banks and things like that, besides um, the actual numbers of how badly things are going. Okay, so at historical junctures such as this, we have a couple of choices to make regarding these lumpy, long-lived investments that our infrastructure systems represent. We can rebuild for the past period, and, we, and when doing so, we reimpose or preserve old constraints on land use and activity patterns. And this is, this is the uh, business as usual approach. So when a water main breaks, what do we do? We don't put in a new system. We dig up the street, fix the old one, and reinforce the old system and all of its problems um, that come along with it. The other option is to seize the opportunity to develop new infrastructure systems that embody new technologies, new principles, and possibilities. And perhaps we might even try for a combination of the two. At this time, it appears that many US municipalities can't even afford the luxury of making this choice because they can't afford to rebuild or even maintain basic infrastructure systems. Hence, they have to develop triage strategies to determine which systems they're going to salvage and which ones they're going to abandon. So if you drive through Detroit or Cleveland or even some downstate communities, you'll see um, these issues raised pretty high. You'll also see them in the Midwest uh, along the Mississippi River in locations such as that. Now the present situation is more complicated still, not only because of the interdependence of our infrastructure systems and the interdependence of regional municipalities, but also because of the need to use infrastructure investments to transition to more sustainable lifestyles and some would argue to rebuild industries in decline. Industries that used to receive quite a lot of business from the erection of bridges, and buildings, and, and highway systems, and trains, and things of that sort. So let's assume in this room today, going forward, that a properly functioning infrastructure system or system of such systems is construed as one whose functioning is consistent with sustainable lifestyles and principles of smart growth that you learned about last week. As infrastructure planners and other interested parties confront the reality we've been discussing, they will surely ask themselves the following questions. What interdependent decisions are associated with managing changes in urban infrastructure systems? What theoretical and methodological resources are available for supporting such decisions? And who are the stakeholders and what are their interests? It was interesting to me, probably interesting to Sarah also, when we sat around the table with the planners and engineers and water system managers in Newburgh uh, <coughs> to hear the different decisions that came together, things that had to be resolved as all of a piece. And, um, who the different stakeholders were and what their interests were. Uh, it was clear that different decision makers had different time horizons, different discount factors, different physical scales, different temporal scales that were informing the way that they thought about these problems. And all of these are overlaid. And this is only one system that gets rebuilt or not, right? But it's one, one infrastructure decision has to solve multiple problems. Um, as in most planning problems, managing changes in urban infrastructure systems will entail determining, not just once, but over and over again, what is to be done by whom, when and where, and by how much, 
and also the political question of who benefits and who pays. Each element in this determination is critical to finding an appropriate planning response. Of course, given the complexity of the relationships between interdependent infrastructure-based network systems, their jurisdictions, their controllers, and the nature of the financing, it's clear that there will be multiple agents, both public and private, facing this planning problem. It's clear that their decisions will affect each other and that the overall infrastructure system will be a complex, <coughs> adaptive one that is likely to give rise to emergent outcomes that no single network controller will have intended. All right, so the outcome of the decisions that get made will not be one that anyone wanted to bring about. This is not unusual. <laughs> All right, I just want to uh, go over some of the properties of complex systems since this is built as a complex problem <laughs> presentation here. Uh, there's an important economist whose name is Stephen Durloff, and uh, he works closely with some people on this campus, but he's very much interested in complex social systems. But the properties of complex systems are not just endemic to social systems, they're also endemic to physical systems. And some of these, Im the important properties are, first of all, non-ergodicity. Now, if you use that word, polite company, you might be excused from the room. But uh, that's also known as path dependence, which says that what happens first has a very strong influence on what happens second, third, and fourth. Uh, and it's also known as the property that conditional probability statements described in the system do not uniquely characterize the average or long-run behavior of the system. The important point about path dependence is that if you just think about a community, when the water system goes in, that influences where the houses go, where the roads go, where other parts of a transportation system go, where the communication systems go. And they tend to have a very long impact on subsequent development decisions. So the first step that's taken is very influential in what follows. And that's true about water infrastructure systems. Um, the second is phase transition, and this property is that very small changes in critical parameters of the system might bring about large qualitative changes in the aggregate performance of the system. The third and fourth properties are kind of mirror images of each other. The third one has to do with emergent properties, and this says that properties that exist at a higher level of aggregation than the original description of the system um, cannot be explained by what happens at very low micro levels. And so uh, we can't get to these aggregate properties just by looking at what individual decisions that might be made below. But these, are, these are of a scale where they are sui generis. The other, other side of that is universality, which is the property that the presence of a system characteristic at a higher level is robust to changes at a micro level. So these are all general properties of systems that are deemed to be complex. You can also hear about properties such as power laws or red queen effects. Everybody here is familiar with the red queen from Alice in Wonderland, where the red queen says you have to run as hard as you can just to stay in place. You have to continually adapt, not even to gain evolutionary advantage, but just to maintain your own niche in the system. Perhaps the best way we can hope to accomplish uh, in the face of complexity, we can hope to accomplish change in the face of complexity, is to identify plans that are compatible within a web of overlapping plans of agents and planning jurisdictions. So if everybody plans all the time, then there's different sets of intentions. And so we have to find those areas that overlap, compatibilities, <coughs> to explore what we can undertake together. Otherwise, collective action doesn't happen. Still, we're going to need to employ modeling tools and able to project over the horizon what impacts would be and to identify possibly compatible system management plans. And when we survey the availability of theoretical and methodological resources to support the management of change in urban infrastructure systems, we might want to help ourselves to results from systems engineering, operations research, network science, planning, 
hydrology, game theory, urban economics, and public finance. When we think about problems of water systems, they don't fall into specific disciplinary categories. They require insights from all of these different approaches. So when something is problem driven, it means that we need to call for help from a lot of allied disciplines. Terry Fries at Penn State University is the chief editor of the journal's uh, Networks and Spatial Economics, which is subtitled the Journal of Infrastructure Systems. And Terry is fascinated by interdependent infrastructure systems. He and his colleagues suggest that it's helpful to view infrastructure systems involved with the movement of goods, passengers, information, water, and energy as general transportation networks. Moreover, Terry and his colleagues argue that to the extent such network systems are interdependent, they should be viewed together as a system of systems. Physicians often talk about our bodies as being systems of systems. We have a respiratory system, and a circulatory system, and a digestive system. And to the extent that we're still alive, all of these systems are working reasonably well together. Um, Terry and his friends view the, main, the five main sources of interdependence between generalized transportation networks as being, first of all, their physical interdependence could also be the nearness of one to the other. Secondly, the budgetary independence, interdependence, when a mayor or a town council or a public works manager has to decide which system to repair and which to allow, allow to go further into decline. Uh, market interdependence and spatial economic competition, who has pride of place. Informational interdependence and environmental and congestion externalities. Informational interdependence is becoming increasingly important. When a particular communication system goes down, the airlines all go down. The banking system goes down. The exchange of information in markets goes down. So we can see that uh, the, the critical, the extent to which critical interdependence has only become more exaggerated um, in recent times. The practical challenge of implementing a system of systems framework is to get the interdependent relationships between the networks into mathematical form so that richer and more informative models to support network planning and design can be formulated and solved numerically. One way to proceed is to represent infrastructure systems as multi-layered networks with constraints upon how the layers are coupled. So we know how to do a transportation network. We know how to do a communications network. We know how to do a water network. But the, the challenge here is to capture meaningfully the way that they interact. Um, and to do that, we impose constraints between layers. We can then arrange the layers hierarchically to reflect their engineering and societal functions. And the resulting multi-layered coupling of infrastructure networks will constitute a system of systems. Fries and colleagues remark that the performance of a system of systems can be significantly influenced by decisions taken by individuals or groups at various levels in the subsystems. What the town of Newburgh does will be influenced by uh, adjacent communities and by water controllers in the aqueduct system of New York City. So it's not unusual to model decisions that have to be made in, in such contexts using some kind of game theoretic perspective or strategizing scheme. And if the layers of the system of infrastructure networks are viewed collectively as the means by which agents in a market economy complete their transactions, then the modeling framework might be viewed as a spatial, computable, general equilibrium model. So a computable general equilibrium model is a model that represents what's going on in the major sectors of an economy, but it has numbers to back it up, all right? And so we can actually compute a solution to this numerically. Uh, when there's a spatial dimension, we're not only solving for quantities and prices, but we're also solving for where those quantities are, and what the prices are in different geographical markets. In such a model, 
the generalized transportation networks can be represented in fine enough detail to support engineering analyses. And this, of course, is what people in Newburgh and elsewhere are interested in. And such an articulation should also enable one to study the influence of specific <coughs> infrastructure not network features on all relevant economic sectors and all locations of interest through conventional comparative statics methods. The equilibria that we might compute with such a model could in turn be used to construct a dynamic model of coupled infrastructure networks based on principles of disequilibrium adjustment. By disequilibrium adjustment, we mean that things don't adjust instantaneously, that there are frictions, that there are commitments, that there are costs that inhibit the way that we're able to rapidly adjust. One of the things that's going to happen in 2021 is that the aqueduct coming from the Catskills to New York City is going to be shut down for repairs. And before that can happen, there are a lot of changes that have to be in place so that the communities that were serviced by that aqueduct and New York City itself will have backup water systems in place. So adjustment processes can be short, they can be very long. Um, Freeze and his friends note that such a model could allow study of the nonlinear synergies and also catastrophes among infrastructure technologies that might go unnoticed so long <coughs> as the traditional one network at a time paradigm is employed. Thinking about a human patient here instead of an infrastructural patient, you may go into the hospital and somebody does a repair on your appendix but you may die from toxic semi or something like that. And the, the operation was a success, but the patient died. So, you know, we, we got to keep all of these systems going um, at the same time. Now, of course, <coughs> systems of system models can be embedded with other tools, visualization tools, <coughs> GIS systems, and they can be put into decision <coughs> support and planning support systems. <coughs> when people use the term decision support, they generally mean that uh, subject-specific knowledge bases and analytic tools are being integrated with inference engines in order to provide users with recommendations of decision sets and indications of probable outcomes of decisions taken. So the decision support systems don't make the decisions for you, but they tell you where to look and what the implications would be if you follow that advice. Yeah, moving miles here. Move the mouse to the right. Move the mouse to the right. A little more. There you go. Sorry about that. <coughs> okay, but planning support systems go further because they indicate how decisions taken at one point in time or place might be related to or condition <coughs> other decisions occurring at other times and elsewhere. And this is really critical if you're making big decisions which affect municipalities and infrastructure systems that are long-lived and lumpy. There's an influential land use planner whose name is Lou Hopkins, and he talks about a plan as providing a contingent path between interdependent decisions. And so a planning support system, to the extent that really it really helps us, will help us to connect up, to stitch together the different decisions which have some effect on each other. And as a run-up to laying out the elements of a planning support system that could be used to explore whether and to what extent urban development plans made by different agents or communities are indeed compatible and can be used by those other than who made the plans to coordinate action, Lou Hopkins, Nikhil Kaza, and Varki George Palafutural elaborate a planning data model, what they call a PDM. And so this is, in many respects, a, a social ontology, a statement of what exists in the realm of where ideas are being thrown around in plans. And the objects that exist inside this model are assets, things that are owned by people to which they have property rights, actors, activities, and specific actions. And Nikhil Kaza, in his dissertation of 2007, later called these the four A's of planning. Um, Hopkins is famous for his 
identification of the four I's of planning, but this is the four A's that a student has, has picked out here. A terrible picture of what this looks like is um, the following. And essentially what we have here are actors. And going in this direction, they can perform activities which <coughs> impact upon assets. Um, they can also create regulations. They can invest, which affects um, investments. They can engage in plan making. Uh, these actors have certain capabilities, and they have authority or influence upon other things. They're mindful of various issues and alternatives that can be retaken in response to them, and these inform decisions, which in turn come back and affect things from this direction. So those decisions affect investments, they affect plans, they affect uh, regulations, and whether or not the plans get used, or whether or not the plans impose some restrictions upon other actions that people may take. And they define um, figure one as, as characterizing a state of the world, it's a particular configuration of these different dimensions of social reality. And they, of course, give sharper definitions of what assets are, um, what activities are. Note that some of these can be Physical, some of them need not be physical. Activities are practices in which actors engage, whereas actions are specific actions that are taken. And capabilities uh, takes in quite a lot. It's not just your ability to do something, but it's rights you enjoy or responsibilities that you have, obligations, authorities that you enjoy because of your uh, political stature or behavioral norms, expectations others may have you. Um, <coughs> actions change assets and capabilities, and whereas assets are affected by investments, which can create, destroy, expand, or contract them, actors' capabilities are affected by learning, regulations, and transactions. So they're packing quite a bit into this planning data model. It's, uh, it's much more rich than just talking about land uses, or property rights, or easements or taxes or things of that sort. It's, it's, it's got some action there that shows the way that the world is recreated. In the situations that Hopkins, Kaza, and George Palathucci will consider, plans are primarily about investments, about changing assets and changing capabilities. Actors make plans, they perceive particular issues, they make proposals for action, have authority and influence in decision situations. And in decision situations, actors use plans, they confront issues and alternatives, and they make decisions for actions. Okay, so that's all in the way of, of background information to get us up to the Hudson River Estuary pro Project. So uh, the project that I'm engaged in, with the help of uh, various graduate students, um, has to do with developing a prototype planning support system for managing change in water infrastructure systems in Hudson River and Mohawk River municipalities. And um, the idea is to propose, a, to develop a system to manage changes such that we're taking into account interdependencies with other infrastructure systems, budget constraints that are faced by municipal and state agencies, and the principles of smart growth to which New York State is committed. And we pledged ourselves to partnering with representatives of a Hudson River or Mohawk River municipality to develop and demonstrate the usefulness of the system in a testbed application. The PSS, shorthand for Planning Support System, should suggest what to do, when, where, and by how much in order to bring about intended outcomes in infrastructure systems of interest, when the actions are in fact feasible, as well as the spatial economic implications of management policies. The PSS should also indicate the sensitivity of the prescribed management solution to changes in parameters and constraints. And the prototype PSS will be based on a spatial computable general equilibrium model that's embedded in a disequilibrium adjustment system so that managers 
of municipal systems can gain a sense of how long it would take for something to be brought about. The model will be calibrated with data corresponding to a partnering municipality in one of New York State's primary river valleys, and the economic data will be taken from the most recent county level in-plan files for New York State, whereas the engineering data on infrastructure systems must be supplied by the partnering municipality or state agency. The model, as most models of this sort are, <coughs> will be solved in GAMS, the General Algebraic Model Solver System, and solution files <coughs> exported to a GIS environment for visualization. And the usefulness of the PSS in supporting management of changing water infrastructure systems remains to be demonstrated with a testbed application co-developed with representatives of the partnering municipality. <laughs> To implement this system in the case of municipalities, some supporting information is required. First of all, the model of the water network, which covers supply, drainage, treatment, and recycling. And the US EPA has a standard model called EPANET, which enables these features to be um, captured, provided we have good GIS data initially to represent where the water mains are, um, what the pressure readings are, etc. Also, we need to be able to assess the <laughs> serviceability of infrastructure. Um, we need models of other interdependent infrastructure systems, such as transportation or power grids. We need the current capital budget for the infrastructure jurisdiction. We need information on the financial position of the relevant communities. Uh, in the case of an intermunicipal collaboration, it would be more than one community. And a recent transportation and land use study. Finally, we need projections of demographic changes and other factors influencing spatial interaction <coughs> and the demand for water. Happy to say that we have all of these items in the case of Newburgh. So our, our partnering community, as you've heard, is Newburgh, New York. It's a city located about 40 miles north of New York City. The city is economically depressed. It has a declining industrial base and tax base, but it is experiencing an influx of young people who desire proximity to New York City, but a lower cost of living. Across the river, uh, you can catch the train in the city of Beacon, and you can be in downtown Manhattan in an hour and 15 minutes. You can't get to Manhattan that fast from Staten Island. <laughs> so it's a pretty good deal. Um, we learned that the leading industry of the city of Newburgh, anybody want to take a guess at what that might be? In the jail. Pardon? In the jail across the river. <laughs> well, all right. Sing, sing, okay. Yeah. <laughs> medical, medical industry. It's a, it's a service that's used by hospitals. Imaging or some... <laughs> well... Bio biotech related something. Right? We're shooting too high here. Yes. <laughs> you are. You're you doing cause <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's doing institutional laundry. Oh, wow. That's what the city is. That's its big export service. It probably does sing things. You know, well, okay. <laughs> People climbing out of the windows using those bed sheets. <laughs> Somebody has to do their sheets. You know, there's, there's an old line about. Uh, industrial base of economy that says that you can't run an economy by taking in everybody else's laundry. <laughs> that's exactly what this, the city of Newburgh is doing. You have, you have trucks that carry up hotels and hospitals and jails and uh, whatnot supplying <coughs> to the city and you see big smokestacks and the names of launderers on them. Uh -huh. uh, that's what they do these days. Okay. Now, requires water. It does require water, and being right on the Hudson, they've got plenty of it. Uh, we should note that the city's water supply is the most intensively used in the Catskills, and because of this, its aquifers are sinking. The city's water supply is located outside of the city, although much of the source water has, is not identified. It's not actually known where all of the source water comes from. There are these mystery springs and sources. Um, 
A recent housing development to the northwest of the city is also causing problems, a runoff of pollutants to one of the city's <coughs> reservoirs. And this map gives you a sense of where this figure out the city of Newburgh here, and then the towns of Newburgh and the town of Windsor here. Orange County is inside this zigzag here. And it's historically a part of the um, New York City watershed. You can see here back in 1842, they're going up to the Catskills to get water. You know, it's, it's said that New York City has the smallest imprint or ecological imprint or green footprint of, of any city going, but really you've got to go a long ways to get water, to get electricity, to get, uh, to get food, to get uh, other things that are used in the city. So uh, we can see here's the present state of affairs where we have both the Delaware um, aqueduct and the Catskill aqueduct feeding New York City, both of which pass through Orange County. The city's water needs are related to the needs of neighboring towns of Windsor and Newburgh, and so we can't solve the problems of any one of these communities without simultaneously addressing those of the others. Um, and there's a need for a regional sharing plan. The northeast section of Orange County is dependent on the New York City aqueduct system for which shutdowns are planned, so something has to be done soon. Water quality problems have resulted in water shortages and require improved system reliability. Some of the very uh, safeguards of the system that are supposed to protect the water supply are not working properly and need to be replaced. The Orange County Water Authority is considering a plan for intermunicipal collaboration, and this plan will provide for interconnections between the city and the towns and allow the three systems to operate relatively independently of the New York City water supply system. It will also provide for water supply capacity to address times when the New York City aqueduct supply is unavailable, provide for improved reliability among all three municipal supplies, provide additional water supply capacity to address future growth projected within the Northeast Orange County area. Um, we should note that much of the city's water infrastructure is distressed that the um, sewer lines in particular have been blown out and in times of high rainfall a lot of raw sewage gets dumped directly into the Hudson River. Um, what's even worse is that we don't know what, to what extent there is damage to the infrastructure because no asset management inventory has been conducted for years. In fact, the entire public works department of this city is four people. No. Now, figure out how many there are in Ithaca. You know, I know I live in Cayuga Heights, and we probably have 10 or 12 people, right? Um, so uh, we asked the city engineer, uh, as we approached some of these places, and we saw the condition that, that the infrastructure was in, we said, what's, what's preventing somebody coming in here and poisoning the population of Newburgh by dumping something in the water supply? And he says, we can't afford to hire security any single piece of infrastructure in the city, and we just don't have it. The city engineer lives in Dutchess County. <laughs> um, most of the water mains are made of wood. They're hollowed out. They were put in the ground over 100 years ago. And like the city of Syracuse this past winter, much of that wood has cracked <coughs> because of the constant freezing and thawing that was going on. And so uh, these four people have to run around the city digging up the street, replacing these wooden water mains. Um, and once again, you're just reinforcing something there that's no longer appropriate for the 21st century and the conditions in which we live. <coughs> Another problem here is that water mains need to be relocated lower because of the higher stress that's on the pavement. And so there's an excellent opportunity to replace them had they the money to do so. Moreover, um, one of the most important water mains in the city passed under a track bed of, the, of Conrail, and uh, it cracked in, in, a, in one of these freeze cycles, freeze-thaw cycles. And so they had to take out the tracks. You know, they had to uh, 
disrupt the flow of, of commerce. And this was millions of dollars of shipping you know, that couldn't pass through because of a wooden pipe put in the ground a hundred years ago. And so instead of replacing it, I mean, what they do today is they put in a sleeve and then they put uh, a pipe inside that and they put sand around it. You know, if a pipe breaks, they pull out the broken pipe, blow out the sand, put the new pipe in the sand, leaving the sleeve in place. They didn't think about that a hundred years ago. And so what they did now was to run a pipe about a quarter of a mile around it so that they didn't have to disrupt the track bed any further. So making repairs can be very costly if you don't have a systemic plan for you know, doing multiple things at once. Here we have a transportation system, we have a water system, we have an electrical system, all intertwined. Um, and then of course the, the grades where you cross the railroad. One of the most important um, pieces of functioning technology in the reservoirs are gatehouses which allow flows to be diverted to different parts of the water system, whether they go to um, screening stations or uh, water treatment plants, etc. These are in disrepair and, um, and need to be replaced. Uh, a new pump station also has to be built and it has been proposed for treated water and they would like to kill two birds with one stone with this plant because uh, one of the things that they use um, is, a, is an aluminum compound, an aluminum chloride compound to coagulate the water in order to take out some of the impurities. But this results in a sludge that's actually toxic. And so they'd like to be able to get rid of the impurities but also get rid of this toxic sludge. And they could do that if they had a centrifuge at the water treatment plant which would allow more impurities to be removed and allow water to be recycled instead of just dumped into the Hudson or disposed of in some other manner. This is a situation where all three communities need to adopt a facilities plan and um, secure funding for necessary infrastructure repairs and replacement. And the total bill, what we're looking at in this area, is in the billions of dollars. It's a lot of money. And the tax base in this community has disappeared. Um, the taxpayers of New York State are loath to carry the bill. Um, I think it's an election year for our current governor, so he's certainly not going to push it. And we don't have an infrastructure bank in New York State yet. So how this is going to get done on time for the uh, 2021 shutdown of the aqueducts um, is anybody's guess. If they stall long enough, maybe New York City will just pay for it. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. What would Bill de Blasio say about that? Maybe that's one of our questions for discussion. <laughs> so the state of the research uh, that I'm involved in here, uh, we have an SCGE for Orange County. That was the easy part. We could use uh, some front ends and some implant data to get that up and running. Um, <coughs> We are securing the GIS data for all the water mains so that we can use the EPANET model to link to the SCGE. And a basic front end is available from my friends at the University of Illinois. And we've been funded for a second stage of the project. And in the second stage of the product, we, project, we will take this prototype and apply it to, uh, to Newberg and look in specific at the issues that are arise, arising there in conjunction with the town adjacent to it um, and uh, to the north and to the south. So um, if you want to, we can discuss these questions. I mean, there, there's quite a bit going on here. Um, you might think about what resources you have coming from your respective disciplines that can address these problems. And who the specific, you know, we just raised the issue of how we're going to fund. This reminds me of the, uh, the old commercial that had King Kong at the Empire State Building. And, and the blonde comes out and says, who's going to pay for all this, you big ape? You know, <laughs> all the destruction that he's causing. <coughs> but, but if I have time, to, do I have Yeah, we have to get to 10 after 4. So. Okay, I, I'd just like to quickly show you what a mature uh, system that's been used in quite a bit of 
work. Let's see. Um, what that system looks like. So this is a project that got underway over 10 years ago at the University of Illinois. Um, its leader is Brian Deal. Brian is a, an architect, a landscape architect, and a planner who learned a lot about computers and uh, has been very interested in land use issues and water-related issues in the neighborhood of Chicago. And um, they've developed a system that's used all across the country and they can more or less hit the ground running in some location and whisk models into it and get going. Um, so this presentation is actually a, a sales pitch that he's developed to, to pitch his tools to other people. But the question here is, is a rhetorical question. What management and restoration measures are most appropriate? What measure would best respond to different possible future conditions? How do we address these questions by leveraging the diversity of expertise at the table? So we want tools that bring people into the conversation and use all of their knowledge, not just to throw information at them and suggest which would be the best one. Um, so LEAM stands for a land use evolution something or other, something or other plan. Um, and it has all of these features. It's systems-based, it's spatio-temporal. Um, multi-model platform, it provides uh, visualization of the layers of activity, it's flexible, it creates for information management, it has a portal which allows different people with different levels of access to uh, be involved, and it provides decision and planning support. Uh, this is a map of an area outside of, uh, to the southwest of Chicago. <coughs> Red spots are, in fact, um, compromised areas of green infrastructure. The uh, dynamic transportation model that runs underneath this, this model is one that I developed uh, years ago. And so it's, it's um, telling you that you can look at a lot of different things. You can see what others are responding to in what you're looking at. You can run sophisticated models, you can get very high resolution, you can get sector specific analyses of particular problems. In the case of um, the Iowa Cedar Rivers <coughs> Basin, we have an interagency watershed plan, so you have multiple agencies working together. Uh, they can all have access to the same set of models, they can all be looking at the same information. Um, this is the river that runs through it's Iowa City here, and um, you can generate documents, you can generate planning documents, you can generate meeting documents, um, you can preserve security on things that you don't want to hit the, hit the fan, so to speak. Um, it can show you information a number of different ways. And we have projections of water demand. <coughs> you can measure impacts. Um, and show you changes in demographics, numbers of households, how they've evolved over time in these different communities. You can, you can trace to what extent there is sprawl or to what extent smart growth is actually being practiced. Um, you can do comparison maps. Um, if you're interested in a specific water issue, groundwater protection mask, uh, groundwater protection change. This was, again, is that image of uh, the stress of green infrastructure. Uh, a big issue in the Midwest is protecting wetlands. Uh, when you have floods on the various river systems, if you don't have the wetlands preserved, then uh, you lose a lot of housing and municipal infrastructure. It enables you to focus attention on particular policy issues and uh, getting down to the um, 
nuts and bolts of how the system operates, you can have distributed data management. So you can have multiple sources of data that are accessible over the computer. You can be pulling in data from one source locally, another from a national source, possibly a third from a satellite. Um, front end enables you to have different levels of security. You can have loosely coupled models, or you can have You can link changes in water, uh, watershed conditions to changes in other types of, uh, of land use, transportation, etc. You can have tightly coupled models. You can have models that run in the cloud. <coughs> This is uh, something that was developed by the group. It's a sketchboard that has maps on it. You can actually change roads and, and various patterns, and it will respond as a computer below the surface. Um, <coughs> one of the things that it does is it uses all the technology and the information that's available to us to make important collaborative decisions. You know, it's, it's not the system making the decision for us. It's helping us to get involved, to engage, um, and to telescope the process by which um, deliberation <coughs> goes on about very, very important issues of water and infrastructure. Um, it, it used to be the case that we would have public meetings, and a consultant would come in and read a report, and we'd say, thank you very much, and then we'd go home and come back a month later and talk about things. You know, we, can, we can accomplish in five or ten minutes what it would take months to do in the past using systems of this sort. beyond these really tiny incremental fixes to the system when you're just like, there's no money, you have these huge problems like, you know, horrible violent crime rates. It's just like, that's what the attention is on. And so, what do you think, like, what do you think the solution will be for funding for, for a situation like that? Like, well, I, th I think that, um, I think that people have to start thinking about cities as <coughs> systems of systems instead of compartmentalized problems, instead of crime rates or rents or how many broken pipes or you know, this, that. You've know, you got to think about it together. And obviously, in this country, as in many other uh, industrial, industrialized countries, where the philosophy of austerity has somehow taken root, We've got to get past that again and, and realize that we are investing in ourselves, we're investing in the future. And just as our grandparents and great-grandparents did at the turn of the previous century, we've, we've got to make the investments. And um, if you look at my chapter in the Oxford Handbook where I talk about the financing of uh, infrastructure projects, it's one of the safest things you can do, you know, because People have to pay the light bill. They have to pay the water bill. Um, you know, these investments last 40 and 50 years. It, you know, it's really a safe bet. And so setting up uh, investment banks, infrastructure <coughs> banks, um, for the purpose of guaranteeing undertaking of, of large projects uh, is one of the smartest things that we can do. Most economists tell us this, you know, and still politicians don't buy it. They just can't bring themselves, kind of like Jack Benny in his purse with the moth flying out of it. Uh, but we've got to, I mean, this infrastructure is falling apart. And were we to invest in the infrastructure that's necessary to bring us up to even serviceable, minimally serviceable levels, it would generate jobs. It would rejuvenate industries. It would create the backward and forward linkages it would allow these economies to re-urbanize. Uh, and more than that, I forget what the statistic is, Susan can tell you how much water is actually wasted and lost in water systems in Ithaca, was it? 
50%, that's what Brian told us. 50%, okay. Just think about that. If we could tighten that up, your operating costs would be cut significantly. You know, just the cost savings alone of putting these things in place. Um, as, long as, we're, as long as we're nickel and diming, we're doing it at our own expense. We've got to think big. We've got to think long term. We've got to recognize that we're connected. These communities all have a stake in each other's welfare. Uh, and, and unless we, we make that change, if people are afraid because nobody has done anything big in over a hundred years, you know, and so they're just not used to thinking along those lines. What we, what we have to realize is that the plan of Chicago, you know, probably the most ambitious urban development undertaking in this country, was sold block by block. The Wacker Manual was used in high schools. There were glass slideshows that were presented in church halls. The, the, the homilies of ministers were written out for them by the committee that was trying to sell lighting improvements, street widening, sewer you know, refinements, etc. Um, and and that's, that's an important lesson too, because you can't impose from above these big infrastructural changes. You've got to persuade the electorate. You, you've got to sell it to stakeholders, but they've got to, they've got to be able to participate in some kind of process where they don't feel it's being shoved down their throats. <coughs> you know, that it's, it's something um, that's bringing a change for the better. We have people who are so frightened of letting go of what they have. You know, we talk about the coal miners in West Virginia and who, a governor there who is opposed to imposing the regulations on pollution of, of the rivers of West Virginia because he, he fears the backlash of the coal industry. I think the story on NPR was saying that actually the number of people employed in coal industry in West Virginia is down to 3%. But people still have you know, that monkey on their back. The coal is king and we can't do anything to offend the coal industry. Well. We have to address people's fears. Fears are real, and we have to have things in place for them to do something else. And we have to have, if we're changing infrastructure, if we're, change, if we're knocking down housing, if we're, whatever it is we're doing, um, you know, we need the plans, we need to show their feasibility, we need to solicit people's political support. We can't just make an intellectual argument and then throw up our hands when people continue to do what they're doing. You know, we've got to, be part of the process, be part of the change. But is not is part of it too, Karen, giving them a vision too? I mean, yeah. because most people, they see what they've got. Yep. They can't envision much beyond that. Well, that's, that's we, we, need, we need more imaginative planning. We, yeah. need, um, we need to show people how to get from here to there. You know, what the, what the dance steps are. You put them on the floor and, and show people you, you can get from here to there if you take this step and that step. <coughs> you know, you know, if we can do that, if somebody finds a better way to do that, they'll really have earned their money in the planning profession. It's a good question and it's, it's a hard one to answer. And, and you never hear a, a politician give an acceptable answer because they're afraid that people are going to immediately scoff. You know, they, they don't want to be scoffed. Well, it's, yeah, sort of the, you know, as you were speaking to, I mean, politicians want simple answers and, and the electorate wants simple answers. And if you ask, you know, I like the, you know, selling Chicago block by block because um, you have to somehow present a complex solution to people in digestible pieces. Um, but yeah, whether it's politicians who don't want to challenge the electorate and assuming that they don't want to think about sort of these complex problems, um, or if people don't have the appetite for that, I don't know. You know, maybe we underestimate people, but it's that hurdle <coughs> of political will and. Um, yeah, I mean, political will is, is a lot of it, but I think one of the interesting things about the planning data model of Hopkins and Company is that those things are in there, you know, and that we're mm -hmm. at least talking about it and recognizing it. You know, in the, the Wacker Manual, which was used in, in grade schools in Chicago, 
they had the problems there that the parents had to work out with their kids at night at the dining room table, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and some of the problems would show the feasibility of implementing these things. And the parents would convince themselves. They would do the math, you know. And they say, hmm, how about that? Mm -hmm. So if people need to go, then we're all set. If anybody wants to stick around and be asked another question, <coughs> I'm sorry if I ran on too long. No, 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 it's easy. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.